So the study came out in 2016 and showed 14 of the 16 people who were on The Biggest Loser regained a majority of the weight they had lost. What's our first thought when we hear that? Oh, they went home and ate whatever the heck they wanted and they stopped working out. That wasn't true at all. So what the the people who created the show and scientists um, who put them through basically this experiment thought is that, yes, their metabolism would adapt to their lower body weight. So what they anticipated is maybe if someone was... Let's just, I'm going to give, these are not perfect calculations, but let's say someone was three, like 300 pounds, they could burn 3,000 calories a day. A person in a body that's 1,500 pounds, that's 150 pounds, could burn 1,500 calories a day. What happened was, was after they lost that weight, a person who was 150 pounds was burning like 1,000 calories a day. So the adaptive thermogenesis was much greater than they anticipated, and the changes in the brain hormones, leptin and ghrelin, was also so much worse than they thought it was, so that the person, all of them who had lost weight were basically, no matter what they did, they were going to regain that weight. Thank you to one of our sponsors, and that's Element, spelled L-M-N-T, but pronounced Element. Element is an electrolyte solution that really helps maintain hydration. Recently, I gave a TEDx talk and I traveled, took one of those really late night flights, I was super dehydrated, and you could hear it in my mouth. You know, when people get really dehydrated, your mouth is sticky. And you know why? It's because I forgot my Element Typically, I always travel with Element packets, and they have 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, and are amazing for hydration. Yet, I forgot my pack. I really felt it. I typically always travel with them. They're amazing. They don't have any junk, no sugar, keeps you hydrated. And if you have low energy from dehydration or you get headaches, it's really important to stay hydrated with not just water, but also electrolytes, which is why I love Element. Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets of Element. You can head on over to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion. That's drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion. They have a no questions asked refund. So if you don't like it, you can get a refund. Uh, typically, I am all about their chocolate, but I am certainly on a raspberry salt kick. Head on over to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion and try yours today. Michelle Shapiro, I am so excited to have you on. You are incredible. You are a registered dietitian, really a leader in your space. Also very vocal on many things like body positivity, intuitive eating, anxiety, and you've gone through your own journey. You've lost over 100 pounds. Yes. And I'm so freaking excited to be here with you today. And I will tell you a little bit more about what my story looked like. So I grew up in New York City in Queens, which was a super diverse place in just about every way you can imagine. And had an amazing upbringing. Part of that upbringing for me was that I always occupied a larger body from the age of around 5 to 18. But when I grew up in Queens, it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't something that I was like had so many issues with. I was still able to make friends. I had amazing grades. I had like a very robust life. And then I was going away to the University of Delaware for my dietetics degree and realized the people there are not going to be like the people in Queens. You know, they're not going to instantly know me. They're not going to know who I am as a person. And in reality, like society judges you for the way that you look. So I said, I'm going to have to lose weight before I go to school so that people you know, can get to know me and not have this barrier between people getting to know me. So I went on a really rapid weight loss journey, which I could not recommend any less. Please don't do as I say, as I'm saying in this, um, and lost close to 100 pounds in like less than three or four months. Went away to school and was basically sick the entire time I was at school and really couldn't figure out why. I was going from doctor's office to doctor's office and they were telling me like, oh, you know, it's all in your head. Some doctors were like, you should lose more weight. That would help you. And I'm like, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's it. Couldn't figure out what's going on. I had panic attacks. I had hypothyroid issues. I had a lot of symptoms and I couldn't put them together. It was only until after college when I started seeing functional medicine doctors, naturopathic medicine doctors, that I started to see like, oh, this drastic weight loss caused this huge homeostatic issue in my body where my hormones were out of balance as a result. And my body was like, hey, you're starving and, and quite scared. And here's the result of that on a physical plane. So it was when I started to rebuild my health in so many ways and repair from also having been on a vegan diet for close to 
I think like 12 years or something, um, that's when I started to see all those health benefits. So it was very not what I thought until I was in my dietetics degree and until I started in this world of functional medicine. And my path to healing after that is really what I characterize as like, you know, I, I give credit to functional medicine for that so much because it, it really was about achieving that balance from a very root cause perspective. You know, we're going to talk about functional medicine. And before we talk about that, you said something really important about your journey. You were, you said you occupied a larger body. Can you kind of, uh, now you're very tall. I mean, everyone <laughs> compared to me is tall, but you're, how tall are you? I'm 5'9". Okay. And how much did you weigh then? So when I was in, I would say my weight loss journey started, I was probably like 250 pounds or something like that. And then lost like about 100 pounds. And I've maintained around-ish the same weight since then. Okay. And you had planned on going to Delaware, right? for And studying dietetics. Yeah. But that's interesting because you actually were significantly overweight for your body. How did the connection happen in terms of were you interested in You're health, the but question. it wasn't that it was like you were fascinated, but you weren't implementing or were you implementing the wrong things? What? Yeah, it's the best question and actually leads to a, a bigger issue that I see in the field. I went and decided on my major. So I originally went for marketing like the first day of school and then switched into the nutrition program within the first semester. I switched over and switched my classes. The reason that I wanted to do nutrition was because like so many dietitians, I was having disordered eating or an eating disorder. It, I don't know what it would have been classified because I didn't see a practitioner. So I wanted to know the secrets of weight loss. So I actually went into the program wanting to, you know, pursue weight loss further. So a lot of dietitians, a disproportionate amount of dietitians have eating disorders, actually. And I know I... It was totally. very visible even in the program, but there's studies that justify that too. But it, it definitely is like a place for people to learn the secrets of it for themselves and of course to serve other people, you know, majoritatively. But but definitely that was it for me. So how did you kind of think your way out of it? How did you get better? How did you get healthy? So I remember there was a point in college when I was having like five panic attacks a day. And I mean like vomiting, you know, the real shit, like real panic attacks. And at some point I remember asking myself like, when did anxiety become your thing? It's never been your thing. Like your thing is that you're funny, you're yourself, you're all whatever these these parts of you are, you're a good friend. When did anxiety become like the main feature of your life? And that's when I started to say, hey, if I can ha at one point in my life not know anxiety, I cannot know anxiety again. So I made this battle plan for myself. And now I make battle plans for my clients. I feel really weird saying that to you. <laughs> Sorry, Shane. I feel super <laughs> weird saying that to you. But um, in that, I, I separated it for myself. What can I do for anxiety from a lifestyle perspective, a nutritional perspective, a supplement perspective? And I just read and read and read and finally came to this conclusion that anxiety was like trying to tell me something. So I needed to listen. And that's when I started healing was when I started to listen to what my body was telling me, the signs and symptoms, drew a picture of it for myself and then targeted, targeted, targeted the exact ways that I could reverse it. And I use the word reverse intentionally. Uh, tell me why. Because I feel that the current model of anxiety is really so much more about managing anxiety. And when we manage anxiety, we aren't listening to it. And I do believe if anxiety happens spontaneously, then it should be able to spontaneously go away, too. So my work with clients is not we don't cope, we don't manage. We try to reverse. That's okay. the goal. That is genius. Can you say that again? Yes. So I think the current model of anxiety is really focused on managing and coping with anxiety. And if it's something that happens spontaneously or it's a current state of being, it's something that can be reversed. And that for me is a very warrior mentality thing, because I think if you know you can only get 20 percent better, there's no way you're getting 100 percent better. So for me, it's very important to use the, the word choice of reversing anxiety um, which is very um, controversial, I'll tell you. You? Controversial? <laughs> I, Never. I, I, can't, I can't wait. <laughs> you said that it can go as fast as it comes. Exactly right. And that is not the common narrative. No, it's not. This was so confusing for me. Same thing with hypothyroidism. When I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism and I was like, oh, I didn't have that last year. And they're like, you got it now for life. And I'm like, well, that's that's not how things go in my life. You know, I don't like this idea that things can happen and also when we do that and we say this is who you are now, your identity becomes your illness. And with chronic illness especially, there are times where we have to accept chronic illness. It's it's part of the game. You have to. And then there's times to fight too. And I think that we've – I've seen, in, at least in the nutrition world, that the level of acceptance has gotten way high and the feeling that we have the power and hope to fight has gotten a lot lower. And that's is something that I'm really working to change with people because you and I – like. 
We've seen so many clients who have reversed their anxiety or done these things. And reverse doesn't mean it's gone forever. You're human. These are survival instincts, you know, to be alive. You're going to have stress and anxiety. But to have debilitating panic attacks that weren't there and then started being there, it doesn't make sense that they should be there forever then. You're done for life, you know? And how long have you been practicing as a dietitian? Eight years, eight and a half years now. What have you seen change in the last eight years from when you started practice to now? Well, it's what I see. I've seen change and what I've made change because I also think and what changes I've had to make. Um, I would say that when I started as a dietitian, it was much more focused on macronutrients, a lot of clinical nutrition knowledge. So like EN and, and you know, TPN formulas and hospitals. I had a, a lot of critical care knowledge, which I enjoyed that part of the curriculum a lot, frankly. Um, and I think that was the focus because the majority of dietitians go into work in hospitals after and private practice was really focused on weight loss. And there was this huge divide between you're doing weight loss or you're doing eating disorders. You know, it was kind of like there's other areas you can go into, but I would say those are big ones you wanted to go into and that were really hot. I would say now there's more gray areas and people are maybe they want to eat and have a, a better relationship with food, but then they also want to pursue health goals. So they're. The camps are still there, but they look a little different. They sound a little different and the people are a little bit different, too. So in a lot of ways, I think the nutrition world from a con conceptual perspective has grown. And then in some ways, I think it's grown more divisive, too. What ways do you think it's more divisive? I think in the past three ish years, there's been a new wave of more militant health at every size, which I don't know if you're, I can also like, it's a, a type of practitioner or certification you can get to be health at every size. I had no idea. Certified. Yeah. Um, which they practice the principles of intuitive eating and body positivity. Um, they also believe that, which is super controversial for some people that health and your weight are really not correlated. So I, I can't say I agree with that. I would, I would assume you wouldn't honestly, yeah. and which, which is why I'm happy to talk about it too. Yeah. Um, I think that conventional nutrition would tell you that they're extremely correlated and then health at every size would tell you they're not correlated. And I would say it's somewhere in between. Much like you've said, this idea that like obesity is not a diagnosis and it's not the right parameter. I would say that weight is not the most important feature of someone's health. And it's certainly, and what I agree with the body positivity camp and the health at every size practitioners is that People should not be treated differently based sure. on their size, which For is sure. like, it's so silly. We have to say that, I but know. like, we have to say that, which is so wild. So that is where the divide is. Now, what I'm seeing with actual practitioners and dietitians is that people feel so nervous to give nutrition information because they're attacked for being biased against people. So the way I like to phrase it is, I'm, I'm going to come for food companies all day. If they're like market, I don't care. If you're marketing to children and to marginalized people to get their money and to sicken them to the point where people have like our rates of diabetes are skyrocketing, our rates of all chronic illness are skyrocketing, like we're going to have to hold someone accountable, right? right? So if someone was body positive, they might see what I just said as attacking the consumer. I like to food shame. I don't people shame. Right. That nuance and distinction is lost on so many people in the nutrition world, which is so frustrating, honestly, because it's like, come on, you know what I just said is not to attack a person. It's to attack a company. But the idea that food can create illness is also controversial right now. Oh, that is. <laughs> That's amazing. So, really? It, it's Yeah, it's super. Like, if you use the phrase food is medicine on nutrition, you're like canceled at this point. It's so I don't, we have to laugh about it because it's like, come on. This is ridiculous. We have literally you and I because you do extremely good nutritional work yourself as a doctor because you're also a trained nutritionist. So if I can watch someone legitimately heal because of some simple food changes and lifestyle changes, you can't tell me that it's not real. So science substantiates it and anecdotal evidence from practitioners certainly substantiates it too. It's just, I think that if you're an eating disorder professional or in this specific ideology, you're not working with people on functional nutrition. You're not actually helping people heal anything but the psychological component of food, which I always say is a huge issue because you can't apply a psychological solution to a physical problem. Say that again. Say it again for us. You cannot apply a psychological solution to a physical problem. And what I mean by that is if you have a parasite, you can't intuitive eat your way out. Of I it. have had patients try. <laughs> like, How did um, it go? Well, you you have Giardia, but um, we're going to have to treat that. No. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to I'm going to have food freedom. Like, that's great. By the way, I value someone's relationship with food so much. I'm a, a 
strategic middle ground person. I am like fierce in the middle. Like I believe in the tenets of body positivity that you should not assign morality to the foods you're eating. You're not a good person if you eat hot, you know, low carb, but there's no, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with your identity and who you are as a person. But do I believe that food has the capacity to heal us or cause or cause illness? Of course I do. I've seen it happen a thousand times at least, of course. And when you are dealing with your clients, so you see clients, you have a team. Nikki's over here. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Great, uh, a great team member. What are you dealing with? What are the the top three yeah. issues? Should I even call them issues? What are the top yeah. three things that you're dealing with? I only deal with three things, which is perfect. Oh. Nikki actually is is has a more broad nutrition approach, which I'm so excited about from a functional nutrition perspective. But I am in the functional nutrition support of reversing people's anxiety, supporting gut issues. And if someone does want to lose weight in a body neutral way, again, not in like the super aggressive calorie counting, which we know doesn't even really work exclusively without addressing other issues um, in, in a supportive way, then I'll support them in those three conditions. Okay. Tell me about the, how can someone support themselves going through anxiety? What are they with? Is it food anxiety? Is it mental anxiety what what kind of things are we talking about yeah I, can i walk us through like a little bit love of my mo model of anxiety too so i think of anxiety as like if we have this image of there's a mom with her son in a playground and her son is pulling on mom's shirt and i call him timmy for the reference mom mom i need your attention kind of like the family guy like stewie you know mom mom sounds like my house every day exactly. oh my god your kids are so freaking cute i would let them pull on my dress no, whatever they have to do go ahead um the more that Timmy pulls on his mom's shirt, the louder he gets, the more she ignores him, the louder he gets. Our anxiety is like a little kid who wants to be heard. And our anxiety can show itself to us through different signs and symptoms. So it could be something like a rash. It could be like acid reflux because we know that cortisol also has the stress hormone, our main like stress hormone, mo mama stress hormone, we'll call it for this instance, has downstream effects on the rest of the body too. And is a, is a negative feedback system. So we know that. So when we listen to our anxiety and our signs and symptoms, our anxiety is more likely to cool off. So our, the biggest mistake people make when they have panic attacks or anxiety is to try to push it away because it's so uncomfortable. Of course, we don't want, oh, yeah, you're, not, you're on a train and like shaking violently and want to throw up. Yeah, no one is like, this is great. But I, I'd say the first step with any anxiety, any way it shows yourself, if your heart's beating, is to just allow it. It won't kill you if you allow it. It feels like it'll kill you a lot, but it won't kill you. And I think that's the first step for people is, is letting that happen. From a physical, that's a mindset standpoint. From a physical standpoint, making sure your blood sugar is regular, nothing signals anxiety to your body more than starvation. So if your blood sugar is dropping too low, anxiety, because your body's going to tell you we're going to die. You know, this is a way for our body to communicate with us. And I would say trying to reduce inflammation from your diet as much as possible because again, if our body's in a state of silent chronic inflammation, it's going to present itself as anxiety too. Okay. And what are some of the nutritional uh, pieces of advice that you give people? For anxiety or for anything? Yes. For anxiety. I would say for anxiety specifically, eating protein. <laughs> like, people are going to think you're a plant. No, exactly. all my, all, uh, my guests are like, oh, you know, protein We're is like great. We're like protein. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but I would say eating protein consistently because protein will help to stabilize your blood sugar too. Making sure you're getting enough of the wonderful types of fats. You know, your sat I love saturated fat. Your saturated fat, your monounsaturated fats, your omega-3s, and making sure that you're getting enough food regularly. Again, if you're, what I see a lot in my practice is people having a lot of anxiety like if they're not a good fit for the diet that they're on, it's their body's way of explaining to them, again, something's wrong. Your body can signal anxiety from psychological reasons or physical reasons. So I would say to people, listen to your body, try to pull the information together. And when it comes to um, food, I would say eat foods that are look as real and as natural in their most natural form as possible for reducing inflammation. And I would also say including protein. I would say this if I wasn't on Gav on Gabrielle's show, I'd still say, it. but including protein at every single meal paired with either a fat or a carb or both, depending on what your needs are, it is is usually really helpful as a starting point with people with anxiety. I agree with you. I think stabilizing blood sugar is really important. I think the mental aspect of understanding that that feeling won't kill you is crucial because then you mm. get better at managing it. You get better. You become more anxiety resilient. Absolutely. Which, which I think is uh, interesting and super important. The second issue that you deal a lot with is guts. 
Totally. Which also is, all you know, I always say I treat these three conditions, but it's always the same person. My clients are all the same. They're like also very similar to your clients, like super badass executives, like really high achieving, incredible people. And with that comes the fact that you have to neglect certain parts of your health and your body. And anxiety is also a call. It's like a call from inside the house. And I'll give one more little anxiety, you know, example, which is that if anxiety is your fire alarm in your house, what we want to do you know, oftentimes if people are quelling it with medication or whatever they're doing, which is completely acceptable and, you know, work with your doctor on that, is you're turning the signal off. If your house is burning down, you don't want to turn the fire alarm off. You want to know what the heck is going on inside of the house, right? So I think, again, that's why it's even more important when people hear the signal coming up to, to answer, the, you got to answer the phone, whatever's going on. So the one of the ways that our body communicates at the most is through our gut. Our gut connects to our brain, our vagus nerve. This is like super important. So a lot of my clients who have anxiety issues definitely have gut issues too um, and vice versa. And either one can be the root cause or it can be both. What are some of the major gut issues that you see? I would say like people are coming in with IBS symptoms. I also do like inflammatory bowel disease and a lot of reflux. To tell you, in the past few years, I've been seeing a lot more reflux with people. I don't know if it's honestly because people are home and just like sitting in bad positions, like you're pushing the acid up. I don't know if that's why, but I've been seeing it in my clients who some of them I see weekly for four years at a time. So I know these people very well. Reflux is not a thing for them. And now they're coming in. This is like a new thing I've been seeing. Do you test them for H. pylori? So I work with functional medicine doctors like yourself to do that. Um, dietitians in New York State can't order mm. tests, but absolutely, that would definitely be a driving cause for some people, for sure. And for reflux, it, do you find that if you take away spicy foods or alcohol, they get better? Or do you think that there's some other pathology that you're seeing that once it's treated, it's better? Yeah. So it's really interesting because a lot of people who have autoimmune conditions present with reflux, which could be an issue of, again... If your body's like we, we have this model in functional medicine, which is like everything is hypochloridia, like we're like everything is low stomach acid. We're like this is the hottest thing in functional and has been for a long time. But what I'm seeing is people are symptomatic of high stomach acid. So like maybe the root cause is low stomach acid, but you can't really like pour heat on a fire that's already burning. A lot of fire, in this episode. <laughs> a lot of fire, but you can't pour heat on a fire that's already burning. And even using the tenets of like Ayurveda, you think about like our digestive fire, our Agni, right? It's like. You want it to be hot and burning, but not like tipping over. So I can use like really cooling foods for people. My issue with the conventional nutrition model of treating reflux is that it does not treat the root cause. You can eliminate spicy foods, but why is your lower esophageal sphincter going like this? You know, why is your body doing that? So I think for me, I'm always wondering what's the step before the reflux, what's causing it. And then I will give them stuff symptom wise, you know, to soothe and to cool, um, which could be foods. It could be, you know, DGL. It could be supplements and, and supportive things like that. But I want to know why is your body doing that in the first place? And in terms of, I mean, so DGL works great. And um, I, there are things that definitely help with, re I know because when I was pregnant, Oh my and gosh. every, you know, I would say most pregnant women who have never had reflux, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, it's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> I know. And it's so aggressive you know, too. Ginger is really supportive again, because it's like, you want the, you want to have enough heat and you want the heat to be in the right place. And I feel like ginger helps to like create a heat and then keep it the, because it's like helping to reduce inflammation too. It's keeping the gut locked, you know, yeah. the sphincter locked. And when you're doing nutritional protocols, are you talking about specific foods, specific rep recipes? How does that work? So when a client comes to me, we'll do an initial consultation. After that initial consultation, they will I will basically be asking them like really weird questions, like super specific questions, because I want to get a feel again of not only what their signs and symptoms are telling me, but how they feel as a person, how they operate. From that, I make like an entire plan that's like lifestyle, supplement, hydration, food, and every single part of that. And sometimes I break it up into different parts, but every single part of that will target every single part of them. So if I'm recommending for someone with hypochloridia, lemon water and salt just as a gentle you know little something because a lot of in, in ways of reflux too a lot of practitioners are quick to jump on that hcl and it's like if you're burning up already your client's going to be symptomatic so for some people i might say have some baking soda in the morning and some people i might say lemon water it really depends on exactly where they're at so i would say in ways of protocols i'm really making it so legitimately customized that every single sentence on that eight page plan is like direct for them and if someone tells me Hey, Michelle, I just can't drink eight cups of water a day. I'm going to tell, tell them to drink four then. You know, it, it's it's wherever they're at. I'm going to take them 10% further than where they're at. And that's how we make progress. I'm going to ask you this 
question very cautiously. Okay. I mean, this isn't like a controversial question. Yeah. We'll get to those later. I love them. If there were a handful of foods, right? So no one food is going to make your stomach better. It's not going to be, there's not magic fairy dust. Okay. If I say, yeah. here's some kimchi sauerkraut, here you go, magic fairy dust, you're going to be better. But are there perhaps a few foods that you really believe are essential for gut health? A special thank you to Thesis for sponsoring this episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyons Show. What is Thesis? Thesis is a game changer for me. It is the world's first customized nootropic company. Nootropics are nutrients found in nature or the human body that enhance cognitive function. And what is cognitive function enhancement? It helps with things like focus, energy, or mood. And these days for me are really long. I am in a podcast studio for an entire day interviewing three people doing uh, bios, all kinds of things. And I need a boost. I need something that is going to keep me energized and mentally on top of it. I've been obsessed with Thesis's energy formula. It's been really helpful for me. You know, many companies take a one size fits all approach. Thesis does not. In fact, I went online and I took their quiz. I strongly recommend that you do it. You can go online to takethesis.com take their quiz. It's a short quiz. They'll send you a starter kit with four different blend recommendations to try over the course of a month. I've tried all of them. I know my favorites. Energy is certainly one of them. And for my listeners, Thesis is offering 10% off your first box. To get your own customized Thesis starter kit, go online to takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion and use the code Dr. Lion at checkout. And I am telling you, this is going to change the way your brain functions And it's going to keep you sharp and motivated and just on point. For gut health specifically, I think, again, like I think ginger, it's it's an herb, obviously, but I think that that's really or a food like a plant food. Um, I think that can be really, really supportive for people with gut health. I also think drinking that in the form of teas can be really helpful for people. Peppermint teas can be really helpful in ways of food. It is. It's hard. You know, it's hard for me. I would say like I could give you that. Every single food I can think of could be really helpful for gut health or it could be really hurtful. Like fermented foods are incredible. Totally agree. With Give you. them someone with a histamine intolerance. They're going to be really sick. And histamine intolerance shows up as gut symptoms, too. So I would say, again, like love fermented foods, love high fiber foods for someone who's, you know, in an acute like ulcerative colitis flare or something like that. That might be more, you know, or Crohn's or something. It might be more damaging for them. So it's really about finding out like what someone's heat is at the moment. And the, I know I didn't give you the answer. Bone broth. How's that? Okay. Bone that's broth. A, that, that's a good one. <laughs> exactly. Again, what you're saying is that, you know, it all depends on what the person is going for. But I would say that the evidence would support, depending on the individual, of course, high fiber is good for gut health. Prebiotics, this whole Absolutely. kombucha fermented type. Inulin, great. Yeah, exactly. There you go. And also um, diversity, food diversity, I, I think is really beneficial. Yes. And limiting a lot of the ultra processed foods. Food diversity is so essential for not only your gut microbiome, but also for, again, your mindset that goes back to your gut too. knowing that there's a variety of foods available and we can get a variety of nutrients from them is so essential for our survival. So, yes, times a million. I would also just say, like, in ways of digestion, sit up straight, not like I'm doing now. Again, don't do as I do. Um, Sitting up straight and then also really trying to eat as slowly and intentionally as possible. I mean, if we think about, like, throwing, you know, a huge... I don't know, like, I can't even think of it. Like, my husband can literally eat the world's largest burrito in two bites. But it's his digestion. He just has a strong fire, I feel I'm like. I'm like, did you even chew He's that? He's very fiery overall. Did you chew that? You're supposed to chew your food that. That should have taken you at least 15 minutes. And you know what? The same person whose digestion is, like, super solid, obviously, again, we were just talking about how amazing Shane is. Shane, um... You, you see it reflected also in their mental health. Again, if you're approaching food from a loving perspective, in a weird way, your digestion is actually going to work better because you're telling your body, like, it's okay to digest this. The systems of our body are dependent on our brain too. It's really important. Um, so I would say the way you eat would be my, my like superfood approach to this is like focus on the way you're eating more than even the foods you're eating. And I don't mean like Every food is wonderful, but I mean, if you're going to eat any food, at least eat it the right way, which is sitting up straight, thinking about how long your digestive tract is too, making sure that you're eating in a peaceful environment. When we are, when our bodies think we're running from a bear, they're not focused on digestion. So we need to actually be in a parasympathetic state in order to digest food at all. So think about your environment around food even more than the foods you're eating. 
that's that's very practical. But you're also saying that you couldn't think your way uh, positively to eat a bag of Doritos, and now you have uh, thought your yeah. way. Th- so but your body knows. <laughs> your body be knowing. Exactly. Uh, that's right. So that very very helpful. I want to talk about weight loss. Let's talk about weight loss. Let's totally talk about yeah. weight loss. What do you think about the weight loss journey right now that you're seeing? Not for you, for everybody. Yeah. You know, we have a. Everybody knows. It seems like everyone knows everyone's business now on social media, and and people are talking a lot about their weight loss, weight loss journeys. There's uh, many weight loss experts, or perhaps not experts. I, I would love to hear your perspective on the landscape and what you think works, yeah. how you take your patients through it. Absolutely. So, what I I think that. Probably the biggest study and biggest thing for me that changed my entire perspective of weight loss was The Biggest Loser. And I'll tell you why that was both as a child and as an adult. So, first of all, we know what happened behind the scenes and stuff was like super uncool, by the way. Wait, Um, what happened behind the scenes? Oh, my God. They were like starving people. It was like super, super aggressive. You're like, why do I know that? Exactly. I I, I know. So it was very aspirational for me as a kid. I was obsessed with Bob Harper. So I'm on a train, by the way, if he ever for any reason on planet Earth heard me say this. Very obsessed with him still. But... I was really into it as a kid and found it super inspiring. So the study came out in 2016 and showed 14 of the 16 people who were on The Biggest Loser regained a majority of the weight they had lost. What's our first thought when we hear that? Oh, they went home and ate whatever the heck they wanted and they stopped working out. That wasn't true at all. So what the the people who created the show and scientists um, who put them through basically this experiment thought is that, yes, their metabolism would adapt to their lower body weight. So what they anticipated is maybe if someone was... Let's just I'm going to give these are not perfect calculations, but let's say someone was three, like 300 pounds. They could burn 3000 calories a day. A person in a body that's 1500 pounds, that's 150 pounds could burn 1500 calories a day. What happened was, was after they lost that weight, a person who was 150 pounds was burning like 1000 calories a day. So the adaptive thermogenesis was much greater than they anticipated. And the changes in the brain hormones, leptin and ghrelin was also so much worse than they thought it was. So that the person, all of them who had lost weight were basically, no matter what they did, they were going to regain that weight, which to me was so devastating because I was like, oh my gosh, like they went through hell. And these people are now being scrutinized for being lazy when they get home of all people. I'm like, these people hustled so freaking hard. So it shows you that willpower is not the most important thing. You have to be efficient with weight loss and you got to go low and slow. That's how I feel. And there's this other piece of it, which is this leptin ghrelin piece that I think is probably the most important link. And the way to like support having healthy leptin levels throughout weight loss is eating more bland foods Losing weight slowly so that your body doesn't have such a huge, you know, knee jerk response to try to keep you alive, basically. Um, And I think that really, again, eating foods that are bio individual for you. And I do think eating uh, animal protein is really important for that, too. Well, I mean, definitely some of the evidence would suggest that it really does help with hunger. Tell uh, the audience a little bit about leptin and ghrelin and, and how that all plays a role in appetite and hunger. Absolutely. Yeah. So when I think about leptin specifically, I think it's the hormone that's going to notify you that you're feeling full. Right. Um, and when I think of ghrelin and we always think of like a little gremlin, we think of ghrelin. Right. These two hormones are there to help your body know when your metabolism needs to move up and when your hunger needs to move up. And they are both there super importantly to help us stay alive, basically. So again, if you lose weight and your leptin levels drop drastically, you're going to feel constantly hungry and your metabolism is going to slow down. That's a recipe for weight regain. Um, So what is, I thought, really fascinating too about weight loss surgery, which is not something that I'm like recommending. No no one recommends surgery unless you're a surgeon, um, is that those hormone levels actually are appropriate for the person's body size after. So that is one of the, I think, the major reasons why weight loss surgery is so much more successful than dieting efforts or something like that, too. Yeah. There's a lot of good evidence that uh, gastric bypass and uh, gastric surgeries like that can be very effective. Yeah. Like 90 percent success rates after five years or something of keeping the weight off, which, again, to each his own. Like, I'm never going to judge of anyone course. to do. But they the I always wanted to know it's not the, just the stomach shrinking. I think the hormonal effect is actually what made it most important. This idea that you could lose weight and the likelihood of you regaining it is almost inevitable if you're doing it in a drastic way. It's like really frustrating. Yeah. I think I had the personal benefit 
of I'm a person who really enjoys bland foods. So I think my leptin levels were like fine during my weight loss, even though it was drastic because I really haven't regained, which is very uncommon. Most people regain weight after they Has it lose been it. difficult to keep the weight off? No, not really. I don't I was never really a person with an appetite. It's that I grew up in a household with a mother who like didn't cook. So I was just eating like stupid fast food and stuff like that. Um, but no, I haven't found that it is. I just what has been harder is the chronic illness that happened as a result of the weight loss that I would have re done. I would have definitely done it differently if I could go back, but it all made me who I am, you know, all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it also allows you to be approachable to patients or people that are suffering. Absolutely. For sure. In terms of weight loss now, where do you think that kind of the spectrum is? So there's this, mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, you know, some people feel it's okay to be very overweight. Some people feel like the grapefruit diet is the best thing. Where is your perspective on this whole spectrum of weight loss? Yeah. Um, first of all, keep your inflammation down the whole time you're losing weight. So if something like a Walls, like an AIP, a Walls protocol, a paleo diet or something is like, if I were to just say, hey, someone can't, doesn't want to work with me or can't afford to work with me or something, and I was give them like a baseline recommendation, I'd say, keep it like as low inflammation as you can. And just that's a good starter point for someone. But again, if your calories get too low, it's it's super risky. And calorie counting alone does not mitigate this leptin issue. So you, it also has to be inflammation. It also has to be focusing on leptin. Um, I would say what I'm seeing now is that there's definitely this divide, again, of people who are you cannot lose weight. It is ethically and morally wrong to lose weight, which, again, is something that you would never see in your For You page. It's like not your world, but it does exist. There's a, a group of people called All Foods Fit, which is that they believe that you can eat any food and that you should never restrict because restricting leads to binging, which is true, by the way, for some people, if the psychological issue is what's driving your binging. What about the fact that these foods are designed for you to binge them? That's the thing. I don't understand the idea of eating with intuition around hyperpalatable foods because they're designed to make you not do that. So it's it, there is that issue for me. Then there's I I don't believe in like fitness bros doing calorie counting either. I don't think that they have. Any I idea totally <laughs> believe in calorie counting. No, and no, <laughs> I believe in calorie counting in ways of in ways of some efficacy, but I don't know that it's going to help again with the leptin and ghrelin. And if people have chronic illness and stuff like that, it's not going to do anything for them in that way. If that's what's driving their issues, which could very likely be like fluid retention and all these other components, obviously, too. But go on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so the, oh, Stefan said I shouldn't move, but I'm like, Stefan. We want to get cozy. Yeah, it's, uh, so I'm working on it, guys. I'm working on the non-moving part. So I hear you. The um, intuitive eating, it seems to be there's this huge push about how everyone should be intuitive eating. That's very confusing for me yeah, as a we can talk about uh, provider and someone who, I mean, my intuition is to never eat broccoli. <laughs> you know, if I, I just, it wouldn't be. So can you explain, number one, what is intuitive eating and how is that playing out? Is that doing more harm than good? And how can we think about it? Yeah. So I actually think that the image of intuitive eating is a lot worse than intuitive eating actually is. It's a set of 10 principles and they're ones that you would legitimately support, like honor your hunger, like consider the satisfaction of eating food, like use gentle nutrition. These are like normal things. That It's not really that. It's the fact that people who are not true intuitive eating counselors are posting saying if you do anything with your food, if you restrict anything, you have an eating disorder right away. So I'm like, all right, if I have a client who's coming to me and it's like, clearly, I don't care if a doctor says my client isn't doesn't have celiac disease. If they're showing symptoms of gluten intolerance, that's actually the gold standard for me to know, oh, they had that and they were super sick after repeatedly. I'm not going to tell my client you should eat gluten for the sake of being mentally well. It doesn't make any sense to me. But the principles of intuitive eating, and I have them here really quick too, like feel your fullness, challenge the food police. So if there's something in your head that's like, you shouldn't eat that. Like, yeah, you would support any of these principles. It's really been the co-opting of the intuitive eating principles on a more mainstream thing with people who don't know what the heck they're talking about. Body positivity, you would agree with too. It's it's the the select few people who don't know what they're doing and aren't real practitioners who are, are very the vocal problem. and they're, and they're, the, vocal. and they're the vocal minority. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And when you are taking someone through, so do you use intuitive eating and teach? I use that principles in, of intuitive okay. eating, which is that I, so if I have a client who has a really damaged relationship with food and I say, Hey, let's do calorie counting. It does not really matter what I say. It matters much more what they're going to do. So first of all, I do believe that like restriction can cause mental side effects. I do. Abs I've seen it. It's true. It's it's absolutely real. The idea that our bodies can be afraid of food and that that can be a hugely a huge issue with survival. 
Like, it's obviously a thing, right? We can't fear eating. That would be very bad and, and dangerous for us. Um, and I, of course, believe that eating disorders are super real and need really specific treatment. Um, so if I have a client who's displaying like a real fear of distinct foods, I might just say, hey, like, how are you feeling about this food? And if I see in body language or verbally, they tell me I, I, I'm not ready to talk about that. We'll wait. And then we talk about it when we do. But I, every single part of my practice is based on consent and knowing where someone's at. I have clients who come to me. They have gut issues. They have all this stuff and they have some really disordered eating. I might not talk about food with them for a month or two because I need to make sure they're OK receiving that information. Because I think of nutrition information like a knife that someone can use for cooking or a knife they can use to harm themselves. So you need to know who is ready to receive that information and how they're ready to receive it. Special thank you to one of the sponsors of the show, and that is First Form. Today, I want to highlight First Form's whey protein. It's a pure whey protein isolate. Listen, you guys know how important protein is. In my mind, it's the most critical macronutrient. First Form Formula One is naturally sweetened. It's a premium source of whey protein isolate, and it tastes great. Not only will you taste the difference, but you'll actually feel the difference immediately. It is a low temperature processed cross flow micro filtered whey protein isolate to help promote assimilation speed and amino acid retention. All of the things that you care about. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion and you can pick your flavor. Sometimes maybe you want strawberry, potentially chocolate. I love the vanilla. That's Formula One Natural Pure Whey Protein Isolate, and it's sweetened with stevia, 100% natural. You guys will love it. It's very bioavailable and rapidly digesting. I think that's really helpful for you know anyone listening and also to feel that someone is heard. Absolutely. Is, is really helpful. Yeah. In the last eight years, have you seen changes in different groups of nutrition and people and your patients coming to you saying, okay, well, I'm going to try keto or I'm going to try vegan or I'm going to try carnivore. Are you seeing an influx or uh, somewhat of a rotation? I am. So this is the deal recently. It's been like really hot keto, intermittent fasting. Head on over to the intuitive eating practitioners, get super sick physically, come to me. That's kind of like the the circle of nutrition life at this point. Not saying only come to me, but come to someone really good who's a functional. There's many, many good functional dietitians. I'm certainly not the only one. If I'm even good, who knows? But point being, there is this do a, res a really restrictive diet, unsupervised or with a fitness bro or something like that. Which I love fitness bros, by the way. Oh, I'm. I'm kidding. Some of my closest <laughs> friends are fitness bros. Kidding. I love my fitness Busting bros. Your exactly. Come on. No, I don't want to hurt fitness yeah. bros either. But like, do I believe? Be offended. Exactly. But you believe <laughs> yeah. in scope too. I do believe there's scope. And I do believe that everyone has their role. And there are people who are trained trainers who are super amazing. Nikki, um, also at nutrition. She's also a dietitian though. But point being, there are consequences of the restrictive diets. There are consequences of completely ignoring the physical aspects of ourselves. And so I'm seeing people bouncing from thing to thing because then your thoughts get so rough around food when you're doing a keto diet. I really have clients who will do a keto diet and they eat one apple and they're like, I can't believe I ate an apple. And I'm like, it's just not that serious. Like it, it just can't. We have to find a way for it not to be so do or die. But our psyches are so driven that way. And then they do go to those practitioners and they say, you cannot lose weight. You cannot cut out food groups because then you'll have an eating disorder. And I'm like, that makes literally no sense. Listen to what the client wants. If a client comes to me and says they want to lose weight, I don't care what I want for them, which brings me to my most important nutrition point of all that I want people to take home, which is the only thing that matters in your health journey is what you want and what you need. So uh, we can be the best practitioners in the world. If you don't tell us what your priority is, we aren't able to support you in the best way. The way we make progress in life is by listening to our authentic selves. Not like you said, it's not necessarily intuitive self, your real you, like the voice that governs the decisions of your life and making that voice the loudest in your head. So if someone else is telling you to do a keto diet, I don't think it's going to work. If you say to yourself, you know what? I don't feel that great when I eat carbohydrates. Great. That's not coming from someone else. So the work I do with clients is having them tell me what they're going to do, basically. So it's all about pulling their voice from them. Mm -hmm. This is a non-science question. Do you think that sometimes the focus on nutrition can mask other things? Oh, absolutely. You mean if people are hyper vigilant yeah. and focus on nutrition? Oh, absolutely. It's it's also just, again, everything always comes back to survival. I'm like a huge evolutionary biology person. Like, I really believe in that. And um, 
it, it really comes back to that. So when I see someone, you know, first of all, I'll say I make this joke with my clients all the time. I'm like, it's it's really not about the Brussels sprouts, right? Like, it's not about the Brussels sprouts, right? It's either it's it's about how you're feeling around anything in your life and that can show up. So I have clients come into sessions and they're like urgent, urgent, urgent. I need to lose weight. I need to lose weight. I need to, you know, I can't eat this way anymore. I don't meet urgency with urgency. I meet urgency with compassion because I want people to actually, if their nervous systems are, are you know, leading the conversation and they're, you know, sympathetic nervous system more so, it to me, it tells me there's something going on under the hood. So that's what a really good nutrition coach will do is, is not meet the urgency and go, oh, we have to lose weight right now. I'm going to say, why does it feel so important to you right now? What are you feeling in your body that's telling you it's so important to you right now? And I know it seems, and I'm not the person who says, again, you shouldn't lose weight. I just want to explore it. It's all about curiosity and compassion and nutrition coaching sessions. That is, I, I bet you everybody has had that kind of experience where they go to someone and they're feeling very urgent. And yeah. when that person meets them with urgency, mm -hmm. no, I mean, you know, it's, it's as if someone is saying, okay, you're really anxious. Oh, you should just relax. Exactly. And they're amped up yeah, saying exactly. you relax. That works when, with women really well. When has that ever worked in the history of ever working? Exactly. Uh, Zero percent. Or if someone came to you and said, oh, my God, this is going on. You said, oh, my God, we have to fix it right I've now. Had, I've had physicians do that. Um, exactly. Yeah. To like in your for me. Right. I'm life. a doctor, but I go yeah, to of course. See you need practitioners. A of course. And I was like, God, I will never see that person. Again. Exactly. You're <laughs> like, slow your roll. Yeah. One of us can be hype at That's a time. It. Exactly. That's exactly. Right. And I think nutritionists are really and I get I get messages from dietitians daily where they're saying, I'm nervous to give nutrition information online. I'm nervous to give nutrition information because I don't want to harm my client. And I'm like, as long as you're listening to what your client actually wants and you're literally, I say, just be a normal person, you're going to be fine. And if someone on you know, social media, like I think you're one of the most, it's so funny, I always say this about you, but you're one of the most middle ground scientific people I've ever met. And people will give you crap for being anti stuff. And I'm like, I know you personally, we talk on the phone for hours. You're the most not anti stuff person like you are so middle ground no matter what you're going to get backlash from people and i know nutrition's like politics right now like totally. it's hot and intense and all this stuff and i feel like again i'm not going to meet that with the same urgency people have if someone wants to comment crap on my page which happens to all of us as practitioners you know let them have the urgency i'm going to be listening and that's or it. you're going to be actually doing things that like are helping important <laughs> and working and Exactly. Uh, Not yelling at people on the internet. Tending to <laughs> other things that are meaningful. Yeah. The nutrition space is very interesting in that way. You have, um, again, a lot, you know, fact and feelings are not the same thing. And what people also have to understand, which I think that gets lost, is that facts and data evolve and change, yes. but there is a foundation of understanding and we have to evolve with it. Okay. It is not so binary. It's not so black and white. And by making it so black and white like that, I think we do a huge disservice. I'll give you an example. Yeah, tell me. So Don Lehman, my longtime mentor, right, 20 years, he discovered this meal threshold of protein. Now, you know, we all talk about, okay, well, you should have a minimum of X amount of protein as if that was such an easy discovery. Right. It was like his life's it, work. Exactly. Literally <laughs> his <laughs> life's work. A brilliant person's life work. Exactly. Uh, over 40 years. And then we have that one piece of information. And then we talk about it as it's like, yeah, everybody knows that. And I'm just thinking, you're talking about 40 years of work for this one piece of information. Can you imagine? So then you take that one piece of information and then you stand on the shoulders of that giant. And then you go through and you experience more and learn more just for that one other piece A of little bite. Exactly. Just for that one other piece of information. And the nutrition space is, is different than it's ever been. It's it's wild. Right we now. used to have to go to the card catalog. And I mean, you're probably too young for that. But to remember, Nikki, you're definitely too young for that. <laughs> uh, to actually go and, and look at the research or go into the library and pull out the journal to look at it. So it, it was a very different landscape than Absolutely. it is today. You also said something else that was really important. There's always been a component to scholarly conversation. I've never seen more disrespect. I know. It's hard. To individuals that have spent a lifetime working in the field than I've ever seen today. It's a it comes from a place of never having done it I yourself. Agree. Right? I it's agree. such a weird thing. It's the same thing also. Don't tell even as a practitioner, not as a researcher. Like you're going to tell me that eating gluten literally like it's like it doesn't matter what you're like if it's if you don't have celiac eat gluten. I'm like, OK, 
are you going to be sitting with my clients when they're throwing up? Because I'm going to be. Or like if you say food can't cause chronic illness, it has no relationship. Are you going to be in the hospital? Like calling, I will literally call, by the way, the nurse and doctors in the hospital and be like, do not, my get, patients. Do not exactly. get on her bed. Like, exactly. Trust me, folks. Exactly. And she's on my good side. I'll tell you that right now. So, yeah. So, again, it's this idea that you have what to say. I actually have a phrase that I use in my family, which is very funny, which is no complaint without contribution. I don't want to hear a complaint unless it. you're contributing. That's the truth. And a, a lot of times the most controversial takes are from people who have just not sat in a lab or they've not sat with another person and had that experience. It's like you don't know what you're saying. Or they're practicing outside their scope. Which happens all the time. Or they are, say, perhaps um, a different healthcare provider, sure. but... I don't know. Um, I, I don't want to pick one, but let's say they're a different healthcare provider or they're not a physician or they are not a nutritionist and right. they don't have the same. Yes, you may have worked into a hospital doing something else, but um, it's not the same of act as actually being a healthcare provider in the domain that that person is seeking. It's it's the Dunning Kruger effect, right? Which is like like the confidence and competence. Like it's like you start off in your career and you're like, I know everything. At this point, eight and a half years deep, I don't know anything anymore. Okay, the like the more you know, the less you know, and that's the honest truth. And it's also because you lose your ego so much. Because again, I could have said five years ago, Gabrielle, you would have asked me the gut question. I'd be like, here's the five best foods for your gut. And now I'm like, I don't know. It really depends. Mm -hmm. Everything really depends. And I think with nutritional science, especially because it's a, it's already a very challenging science. And like you said, for you to get that one piece of solid information, I think another huge issue with the nutrition world is we don't have what I like to call nutritional consensus. So this probably happens in the medical community at some point, too. But our way of getting consensus would be like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which we don't agree with. Most of, you know, their sponsorship is like, as we just Hello. saw last week. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not only that, it's that academia can sometimes fall behind real life application, which is like why we need research for all of those things. But when it comes to a clinical thing with dietitians, too, for something to be filtered into a hospital, like it needs to be really well researched. So a lot of the stuff I see, you know, clinical dietitians using, and I love dietitians and I love clinical dietitians, but they're using the nutrition care manual in hospitals. And it's <sighs> for, exactly, it's for me like stuff that I would never, would never be applicable, you know, yeah, in any part of my practice. So there's no like one governing body. So people, there's like 20 different camps of dietitians at this point. And then you have other nutrition professionals like CNS, FNTPs, like these are legitimate nutrition professionals and everyone's learning a different curriculum and if they are learning the nutrition curriculum from dietetic school mm. they're not loving it anyway so you know it's 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 hard because there's not one place for us to land but i think if you like have experience and can analyze your own research we kind of come to the same conclusions which is that like there's there are some nutritional truths like you said we have enough information to make normal food decisions at normal supportive food decisions at this point all these different groups do you think that eventually there will be some kind of consensus? We do have definitely position statements, for example, um, the combination of medicine and nutrition for clinical care. We have, yeah, position statements. But the I believe we have position statements, too. I just don't believe that they are supported by most dietitians. What the, do you think is going to happen with that? I hope that enough people, well, I don't wish this, I think that enough people will experience, again, you know, because I have a lot of like eating disorder dietitians who are in my DMs and are like, I'm kind of interested in functional nutrition now. I think that I feel in my heart, of course, that functional nutrition is the ultimate. What is functional nutrition? So when I think of functional nutrition and it's it's similar to functional medicine, but of course, in my scope, which is that if someone had a thyroid issue and they, of course, you know this for the audience and they went to a maybe a, a modern medicine doctor, they would say, here's an exogenous you know, thyroid supplement from a pig. Here you go. Take this pig thyroid. If you went to a functional medicine doctor or nutritionist, we'd want to first ask, why is your thyroid doing that? And from a functional nutrition perspective, again, thinking about like the link between your thyroid, your gut, your liver and everything. I'm like, are your organs even functioning? Like, that's what I want to know. I want to walk it back, walk it back to a, like a cellular organ level, basically. So functional nutrition is getting to the root cause of things, addressing like the terrain of someone's body, addressing their biology, their social systems, basically everything that makes them who they are, and then drawing, you know, really targeted specific solutions that 
that are at the root cause. But I have now I have an issue with functional nutrition too. By the way, it's the Dunning Kruger thing. You just get because you're I think, exactly right. Exa- you're exa- you're exactly which that's is why functional I want to medicine it, too. And we always is, joke with the biohacking stuff too. It's like you know right. And there, it, it's really interesting when you talk about the functional nutrition and functional medicine space. It has its the best intentions are root cause. But again, you must balance evidence, scientific rigor, absolutely with evidence based practice, which of course also include experience, but there has to be um, a good foundation of understanding and a good scientific foundation. And Absolutely. people have to be practicing with their scope within their scope. And I think yeah. functional nutrition and functional medicine has been like, oh, for me recently, because I'm like, we had it. I think we had it, guys. We were so close. What's been frustrating me is people are like walking into doctor's offices and it's like test first, test first. I'm like, get to know the person first because you don't like, obviously doctors like testing is a huge component of a functional medical practice. Or any medical practice. Of, yeah. A hundred percent, you know, like tests don't guess, right? But the at the heart of functional nutrition is you need to like think about like the timeline the matrix like you have to understand the person in front of you to understand every single part of what's going on and and just a test is not going to tell you all that information that's really important especially from like a functional nutrition and coaching perspective i need to know like were they breastfed 50 years ago for me to know like any recommendations i'm going to make today you know that's impressive <laughs> it is really important to understand the archetype of the patient absolutely that's actually where the real magic of medicine happens mm-hmm. is the interface between understanding who you're looking at in front of you and their archetype. Stefan, <laughs> I heard that. Leave this in, Stefan. Yeah. You're in trouble. Oh, she calls you Stefan. I call exactly. you Stefan. Like, we'll do whatever we want. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. As long as we don't call you a couple other four or five Who cares words. if he's offended? Yeah. Um, it's really important to look at the patient. And yes, testing is critical. But without understanding what is driving the nature of the human, not going to be super effective. No. And you can also treating based on these tests. This is a new hot thing in the functional nutrition world, by the way. Which, by the way, I'm super out. I I have no idea of what's even happening. It's Um, it's super hot to do like you do a test and then you give a supplement protocol based on it. And I'm just like, oh, that's not functional nutrition. I call that like fake functional medicine. And how do we even know if these tests are validated? uh, a hundred percent. I know. It's so funny. And not this only is, that, but so um, blood work, response to food, all of that stuff changes, at, I mean, so quickly exactly. as you're eating. It's a so snapshot. And that's all that it is, a snapshot. How can you make long-term decisions or even uh, groups of decisions based on things that are so transient? And also, is this a validated test? Exactly Just right. Just questioning. I mean, again, a lot of these functional nutrition or medicine tests are like hot and new, too. Like, that's it's a big... I actually had the fortunate unfortunate thing happened to me, which is that dietitians in the state of New York can't order these functional nutrition tests. So I've had to rely on using other practitioners when we really, really need those tests. Excuse me. I don't think that you are sending anyone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. I'm anyone. very offended by this. Um, I do. That's so, that's so yeah. true. Um, but I, I, for me, it's like, instead of test, don't guess, I'm like, ask, then test instead of guessing. You know, I think that it's relying on these tests goes exactly against the spirit of integrative and functional medicine, which is knowing the whole of a person before you make any recommendations to. And this is super hot online right now. You take a gut test, they send you a list of supplements after. And like the people who are doing that, like own the gut, the, yeah, of course, the, the, of the course. supplement companies. It's it's just the consumerism issue again. Totally. You know, and then issues. on the flip side of this, this testing, right? So you can, I'll, I'll just pick on guys for one second because guys, all they care about, and I'm also kidding, mostly, is good hair and testosterone. <laughs> so every time, okay, well, hey, doc, what's my T? What's my T level? And I'm like, well, how are you feeling? He's like, you know, they're great. I feel great. You know, good erections, the whole thing. And you look and the testosterone is, I don't know, morning testosterone, 300. Like 300, right? right exactly. Or 400, yeah. whatever right. it is. Well, you might not, I might not say, okay, hey, dude, you know, based on this lab, we're going to really bump up your testosterone and crush his confidence if he's feeling amazing. And Absolutely. And of course, that is just one example of you know, what we see, you cannot just treat. And we know, like you said, food is not the whole thing. How someone's feeling is not dependent on one distinct thing. It's also the idea of conventional medicine or modern medicine is that you have a problem and you have a solution for it. And it's viewing the body as something that breaks and then you fix it when it breaks, right? Like functional medicine is that our bodies are always whole and complete and that our body sends us signals that we have to listen to. And then we support the body in getting back to its natural state of health. So the idea that, again, 
you're giving someone a supplement that's a prescriptive fix for something that's conventional medicine. It looks like functional medicine because these hot, cool doctors are running it. And by the way, so some of my closest friends in the world are functional medicine doctors. I, are hot, They're, cool yeah, doctors. Yeah. The literal hottest person on planet Earth. I said that the second before we Heist started. God, yeah. Exactly. God. She's, first of all, she's, are you bad. Freaking she's, kidding just, me? she's kidding. I was actually thinking about it. I'm like, I don't even want to sit next to her in this interview. Are you kidding me? But point being, they are doing, I, I think functional nutrition and functional medicine are like the closest we've got besides what I would ultimately believe is probably Eastern medicine, which is a different kind of amazing research that's been things that have been passed down for thousands of years. There's got to be something good there, you know, if that's happening. Who too. knows? That's way exactly. outside my scope of expertise. Maybe I, I like, can find someone that can talk or you yes, can talk I actually, about that. I have someone. Oh, you do? By the way, Dr. B. Yeah. And by the way, I think supplements are phenomenal. And again, so in my oh, yeah. practice, Please. right? Yeah. And in my practice, it's really important to do, um, again, we use medications because I believe that we have access to them. So a mix between medication and supplementation, I think can be really, really valuable. Also, the goal is to not be on supplements or medication for your entire life. Like how do we get someone better instead of having this pillbox of 5 million things, Exactly right. right? When half of us can't even find our socks. I'm not talking about anyone I know in particular. I'm just saying about that for a friend. <laughs> and how, how do we do that and, and get to a place where we need less things over time and not more? It's, it's a really good question. And also, again, this is where I want people to be their own advocate, but I don't want people to be their own practitioner because this is the beauty and art of a practitioner is we can say, hey, let's do this. Let's figure out if it's working. Let's, it's, it's the constant moving and feeling and listening and testing and everything like that. That's the art of the practitioner, which is normally we think, again, like, you know, I always, my clients always come to me right before they start working with me and they're like, what do you think about this supplement? I'm like, I don't think about any supplements any part of my life. I don't think about them. I want to know what you need and then we can use them as a tool. And I think that what's so hot right now is also just like every supplement in the world, just like take supplements. This will, you can't prescribe a supplement to fix a problem. It has to be part of the picture of health for someone's whole body. So again, if you're going to a practitioner, this is advice for, as a, you know, as a client, Start with your symptoms. Don't give solutions because I want p patients to get the most out of every single doctor and nutritionist appointment in the world. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, Dr. Lyon, I, I really I want to talk about Ozempic. It's like, no, tell me what you're feeling and I'll tell you if Ozempic is a good fit. That's actually what you do. So I think patients are I think people can should use Google to learn things about their own health, to feel less alone and isolated. I'm not like against people learning as much as they possibly can, but you got to go into an appointment with your symptoms, not with supplements or medications. Go in with your symptoms and signs. People would be really lucky to have you as a, a provider. I feel the same about you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel um, the same about you. <laughs> in terms of weight loss, when you take people through weight loss, what do you? how do you work on that with them? Because you don't do, do you do, okay, this is your maintenance calories. We're going to calculate how many calories you've been doing. What is your... You don't. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, exactly. like, oh, no, which is, ex which is fine. Yeah. So I have um, I'm in part of their battle plan. It's color coded for macronutrients. So, so is this a army or navy battle plan? It's, it's navy seal chain. <laughs> <laughs> like he's looking at that camera specifically. Um, I learned so much about the military because of you. I used to call everything the army. It's like so offensive. Please. I'm so sorry. I don't you know, like I have the most respect, please. Um, but it's I know I have to change this whole thing. I'm so no, no, embarrassed. It's great. It's great. Go, 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 go. We want to hear so, what you do. So in my in the meal structure, I call it portion of that plan. And again, if someone has disordered eating, they're getting like, hey, make sure you eat protein three times a day for now just to make sure they can tolerate. But when they're at the point where they can, um, it's broken down. Every single meal gets like six different, depending more or less options. And each option is color coded for what macronutrient it is. So instead of doing something where it's counting, I'm doing the counting basically. And then they'll eat loosely according to that. But I also say if like, if you're actually hungry, please eat more than this. Like it's not, don't eat according to a piece of paper, but like it's a, a structure. And I do the calculations in the back um, based on again, it could be really intricate. Again, if someone's like dealing with histamine intolerance, I'm like, all right, we have to eat these specific types of proteins. So the considerations for those foods. What would be an example? Um, you want just the most fresh, like I wouldn't do deli meats or I wouldn't do anything uh, like uh, preserved meats or anything like that. Like you really want fresh, not leftover meats. And that would be important for me to talk with the client about too. Um, I'm really into histamines these days too. But again, like if I were to do lemon water for someone because they have hypochloridia, but then they're also dealing with histamine intolerance. Then Which I'm like, is what? So a, a 
a protein produced by our body and our immune system. And unfortunately, it's unfortunately housed in literally every cell of our body. So it's not like you get a histamine symptoms can look like a bunch of different things. I'll tell you that post COVID um, just getting the actual virus, a lot of people are experiencing what I think some long haul symptoms. And and this was really cool. That stu- Did you see the study with Pepsid? and long haulers and they found that it like reduced symptoms dramatically and that study really prompted me because i was like why because a lot of the symptoms for long haulers have been driven by histamine intolerance or as proposed by the study and anecdotally from what i've seen with clients too um so people who didn't have issues with this you know and we need histamines for a lot of different functions of our body but when you have an overabundance or you're uh intolerant or you can't get rid of it and you need more dow enzyme to get rid of it it can lead to like really brutal symptoms for people which resemble those long hauly symptoms so um like histamine builds in food over time so you want fresher food for those people also like really annoying things like citrus like lemon water is a histamine liberator so it can make like more histamines like come out essentially. So for someone who has like low stomach acid and I know they have that, but then they also have histamine intolerance. I'm like, all right, I have to choose apple cider vinegar to get the stomach acid up instead because I know the citrus in it. So like these detailed, every single recommendation I give is like every single part of the person at once. If I'm like, they don't like to eat at this time because they're working this time. So it's super like detailed and dependent on the person. I'd like to take a moment to thank one of the sponsors of the show and that's Inside Tracker. You can head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. In this episode with Michelle, I talk all about the questions related to diet, what is a healthy diet, what makes a healthy person, and what are the thoughts around weight? Well, with that, we must be able to understand what's actually going on inside our body. Thinking that you're healthy doesn't always mean that you are healthy. Data is critical. Inside Tracker will allow you to see what is going on within your blood and how that relates to the rest of your body, whether that it's thyroid or iron or inflammatory markers, all of it matter. If you feel like you are doing the right things by your body, then you should be able to prove it to yourself. The only way to do that is to get your blood drawn. And if you haven't done it, you know who you are and you should be doing it. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. I have many patients that use Inside Tracker. I also have a lot of executives that do this and send over these results to us at the clinic. And if you're interested in seeing what's going on for you, this is a great way to do it. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off the entire store. And then for for weight loss, you have them, do you, do you set body weight goals, muscle mass goals, body fat percentage goals? How do you kind of- It really depends on the person. I mean, I would say that if people are too triggered and they can't, and this does happen, and they can't tolerate any sort of measurements- we might just go off how clothes feel for people who like more detail. They might get a body fat scale and I'll and I'll see the numbers. I'll log into their account or something like that. I'll also look at other measures during the weight loss journey. Like a lot of my clients wear CGMs and things like that, too, for me to know, like how effective we're being with insulin and weight loss, because I think insulin and leptin are like two pieces. Um, so it depends. Some clients legitimate measurements that I'm taking. Some clients were going off of non-scale victories and and feeling really good. And again, there comes a point where every client will say, and I check in and I'm like, hey, is this, do you want to measure progress? Because for people who are losing weight, it's really disturbing to not have parameters, but it's also disturbing for them to, to have parameters sometimes. So some people are not ready when we start and then they're like, it's just data. And I want everyone to view every part of life. It's just data. Great. It's just another number. Don't put so much heat in the number. Like it's just a number. That's know? great advice. That's great advice. And it actually is advice that allows people to unshackle their mind and move forward because again, it is just a number. We just got to measure the number. Yeah. It's data. That's it. Absolutely. How do you recommend people go through behavior change? Oh yeah. That's a really good. So I think that my I'm very into internal family systems and psychology right now, which is that we have like that movie Inside Out, which like maybe your kids would have. They were too. They, wait, they wait, 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 wait. What, what is it about Inside Out? Well, no. Is, so inside, is it on Disney? I've seen every movie on Disney. So Inside Out's the one with the brain. And then there's the little different like anger person. Yes, talking to I've the, seen yes. it. So it's kind of like based on this psychological theory, which is that there's different components of our brain and who we are that interact with each other. And all of them are good, positive and trying to save our lives, basically. 
But when I see a lot of with like binge eating or overeating for people is that the voices that are very protective for them and not there's one true voice like the you always talk about this, the authentic voice. And that voice is often suppressed. So it can be like a voice that's like, oh, you know what? And it's like a mom and dad voice. Usually it's like, you know what? You really shouldn't be eating that. And then a voice responds and is like, no, screw you. I'm going to eat that. And then another voice responds and is like, well, you might feel sick if you eat that. And by the time you actually get to a food decision or any behavior decision, you're freaking exhausted and you're experiencing decision fatigue. So then your authentic self who's locked in a room somewhere, you, you can't make the decision. So then we get the screw it. Screw it. I'm just going to do whatever. <laughs> then the screw it. Or the. You that know, that's is hilarious. Yeah. So these voices are and this is I mean, I would say anything I've done in the past eight and eight and a half years applying within my scope. These principles of people has been the most transformative for binge eating and overeating because I think people don't realize that we have these like five different voices. People are like, am I crazy because I'm talking to myself? I'm like, the committee. be crazy. Yeah, that, the committee. I literally went in my anxiety journey, which was hugely helpful for me, is I had like five different Michelles sitting at a table and they would like meet and we would talk. And like one of them would be like, I'm so scared. And the other would be like, shut up. Don't you're not scared, you know. And we all have this going on all the time. So for someone like you, Gabrielle, who has a really positive relationship with food, you have one voice like, are you eating this? All right, 100%. Great. And it's you. That's your voice. For people who are struggling with their relationship with food, it's it's really heavy and intense. And I feel for them so deeply. If you can just I take I have my clients take a piece of paper, divide it into whatever voices you hear and just write it down. Remember, our voices want to be heard. They're little kids that want to be heard. Sometimes it is an inner child version of ourselves too. write it down. Let it out and understand every single one of these voices are, is, is trying to protect you in some way. One might not want you to gain weight because it's scared from a societal standpoint or a health standpoint. One of them could be a, a critical parent or something like that. Get to know them, name them and, and have a committee, like you said. And then eventually what happens is when the voices can chill out because they're just like, you have to listen to me. You're going to die if you eat that cookie. Finally, your voice can come out, which is a chill, normal voice like your voice and just be like, yeah, just eat it or don't. Like it's not it's not that heavy, you know, but that it becomes less heavy when you can get that real voice. And it has to be yours. Like, Gabrielle, if you came to me and you were like, help me with something. And I was like, are you OK? You would be like, never talk to me again. <laughs> like, Click. It's, exactly. It would be like, you know, you you have to like talk to your voice. Like if people talk to themselves and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry you were feeling that way. Like it would work for me because I'm very soft and mushy. But like for someone, even though you're very soft on the inside deceitful very very don't but tell anyone exactly. that you're the softest my... most warm loving person i've ever known i mean that um but again you have to talk to your voice just like you would talk because if you're talking to your voice in a way that feels incongruent your voice is not going to listen to you or bite back so listen to the voices organize them have them talk don't interrupt let them do their thing even if it's uncomfortable and then eventually your voice is going to rise to the, and you're going to be like oh Oh my gosh. So are there five, six voices you think? I think that, so there are like ones that, like the fireman, there are ones that are, I, I have people make their own. I feel like in binge eating specifically, I've really seen like critical parent, upset child, and then like some sort of um, ad adult adaptive version of you that's like, let's get over this right now. And then I'd say there's like four and then your own voice. I'd say usually, and then, like I've been seeing with my clients because it would be and would be with your clients too, like super intense feminist voices that you, you can eat whatever you want. Like this has been coming up a lot in my female sessions, which is like someone kind of comes in to save the day to be like, it's the screw it voice, but it's in a very strong sense because you needed someone to shut up the chatter. So I would say like four voices is what I usually hear, but you could have as many. And, and one more example I'll give is that I had a client who came from a culture that is patriarchal. And so when we were in a session, you know, we did like two sessions and we were going through food voices and she couldn't find hers at all. And it took us going like understanding the childhood voice again within scope. We're not touching trauma, nothing like that. Um, understanding the childhood voice for her real voice to come out because it had been suppressed for so long. So it's not like super comfortable or easy for anyone to do this. But people really have to do their work. And anyone can. So I would say, especially if you're at a decision fatigue, screw it state. And people always say, I'm a self-sabotager. I'm like, I don't believe anyone. Why would you? You want to survive. You yeah. want to be happy, I, right? I, there's a great book called The Mountain Is You. Have you read that book? Yeah. And it really is. It's, it's not self-sabotage. It's this discomfort with something new, a new experience, a new way of processing. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is like our neurological norm is to obviously want comfort, but at the same time, want new experiences. So I, I think that for people to also, which is something that you and I should definitely always talk about, which is that 
so much of life is tolerating discomfort and then also knowing when it's not time to tolerate discomfort. And I think like sitting and listening to these voices and these icky things, uncomfortable is good. Pain, trauma, take a step back. And if you need more support from a trauma therapist specifically, do that too. Yeah. It's like, it's know your limits and listen to your limits too. And when someone identifies that, those voices and things become quiet, the authentic self raise it, rises to the top, is that practice or does it then become knee jerk? So I think it becomes more knee jerk over time. So if I, if I, Michelle, like go through a bad time in life, I'll start getting like, I have a voice that's super feminist wearing band t-shirts and a leather jacket and red lipstick and like smoking a cigarette. And she's like, what do you want, bitch? Like, that's like, she's so, <laughs> she's like so aggressive. I call her bitch Michelle actually. And she'll come out. It used to be like a hundred times a day. And it's like, are you seriously going to eat that? And now it's like once a year it'll come up. And I just laugh. That's the other thing. My authentic voice is so at the forefront of everything I do now that I can easily say, oh, there she is. Another thing that can help people, too, is like identifying colors for what you feel when that person comes. So like if, you know, bitch Michelle comes, I'm like, oh, red. There she is. I know her. I know these different people. The voices get less when you listen to them. If you're suffering from some sort of trauma or mental illness, this is a totally right. you know different ball game, and I really recommend people seeing a trauma therapist, of course. But you know, for people with just making daily decisions, yes, the more you listen to the voices, they feel heard. <sighs> they can come down now too. Sometimes you have to interact with them by writing them a letter. You might have to interact more directly, but yes, over time. And it, I always say, I know when my client's having success, when they don't care about the thing they cared about before. I'm just like, hey, remember when it was so heavy? The food stuff is that still going on? They're like, what? I don't even like, is that a thing? Yeah. So liberating for people. The autonomy. And it's, again, it's always about mastering your own health by listening to only you. I'm not important in my client's journey. All that's important to me is what works for my client. So everyone looks so different. These voices, you know, look so different too. And I, once you know someone, I also can facilitate because I'm like, Hmm, I know that voice. I'm like, is that, I have a, I have a pitch. Is that maybe dad? And they're like, yes, like that's exactly who that is. How'd you know? I'm like, cause you've talked about this 50 times. Like, obviously I know who that is. So it's, that's why the practitioner comes in so, and is so important. Cause you build that rapport. And I know, I mean, some of my clients I've seen for over 100 hours. Like those are my, it's impressive. It's more than I see my family. Like these are, you know, these are like the most, these people are so important to me because I, to know someone like that, it's such, it's an experience like nothing else truly. Mm. When you are seeing these patients and they understand the voice in their head, they understand their authentic self, is the next step to have a plan in place and execute the plan? Absolutely, because that's the, exactly right. That's the exact time when they're ready to receive nutrition information, too. Because, again, if I gave them nutrition information before, what's going to happen? You know, the dad voice is going to come in and be like, well, now you, I told you the dietitian said and I agree, you know. It has to be when it's coming from them. And this is where I think the intuitive eating crowd gets it wrong. They think there's one step. Heal your relationship with food. I think there's two. Then heal your body. Right. And you're 100 percent right that when you heal your relationship with food, you can invite in that nutrition information and everything becomes data. Then it's just like, yeah, I feel like crap when I eat gluten. All right. Nothing more than that. There's no morality attached to it, which is so important for people to understand. You have to remove the morality of th from things that you're doing in your life and behavior changes like also, you know, I see people on weight loss journeys and they're like, I'm so like, I'm amazing. I'm like, I barely talk about my weight loss. If you want to know something about me, it's like the least cool thing about me ever. I don't think we should make our successes in our health the most important part of our personalities because you're going to lose it at some point too. Like, you know, you lose Great looks, point. you lose everything. So point. don't make your whole identity that. Make things just like data, part of life. Great. Of course, celebrate yourself, but not turning it into this morality thing or who you are as a person, obviously. I think that's a really great point. It's it, not making it about the weight loss, not making it about the looks. That is going to be very freeing for people. And also it has a lot more longevity. Absolutely. And yeah. again, weight loss is like obesity as a phrase, right? It's a temporary state of being. It's not who you are. If you think the most important thing about someone and what you're judging about someone is the size of their body, like you're kind of weird. Like that's a weird thing to care about. Like care about the soul of someone and what's actually going on with them. To me, that's always so much more important and impressive to me. Like I would never, just so weird to me. Such not a New York thing, by the way, too. I feel like we kill it in New York with that. <laughs> like we're really cooler than that, man. I don't know. Um, You have a practice. Tell us a little bit about your practice. Yes. So I just hired... Nikki, too, in my practice. So I see clients one-on-one -on -one in my practice. Um, they can work with me on a minimum of three months and then up until 
however long you know, we, exactly, I'm around. Um, and then I also have Nikki working in my practice who I've been training for about a year. She's also a functional dietitian. Again, I work with those three conditions, anxiety, gut issues, and body neutral weight loss. Nikki is going to be helping people in a supportive way in, in a lot more broad ways with functional nutrition. I'm so freaking excited that you're in the practice now too. Um, and I also just made a podcast that, you know, I think I'm a very special amazing. guest on. Let's, let's hear about the podcast. So the podcast is called Quiet the Diet, and it's really about helping people to access bodily autonomy and in, in all of their health goals, and really about, again, quieting those other voices and influences so that you can learn exactly what you need for your health. And we're going to have really cool guests, really, really cool guests talking about topics, again, around functional nutrition, around whole body healing, natural healing methods. But really just about how do you become the boss inside of your body. And I'm so excited about this. I love that. I think it's going to be a very successful podcast. You know, you're skilled in a lot of things. And I think that one of your superpowers is absolutely communication. Thank you. I, my Mark my words. This is going to be a top podcast. So everybody listening here, I'm going to put all the links at the bottom. I'm going to put it in my newsletter. I guarantee you, your podcast is going to be a huge success. Thank you. I'm too awkward and humbled, but thank you very much. I really, I, I really mean it. Thank you. Michelle, you are amazing. And Who's talking? it is very much a privilege to have you on. I know everybody learned a lot and I'm going to put where they can find you and it's going to be phenomenal. So thank you so much for coming now on. Now I get to say my thing, Gabrielle. You're like the day that we met each other, we instantly became super close friends. You meet maybe like three people in your entire life that connect like we do and people like you come once in a, a million years so you don't understand the privilege and honor of being able to thank sit you. down with you on this i love you and thank you so much for this opportunity oh, and experience i love you too